Good afternoon, and welcome to the City Club of Portland, Portland's own Citizens Forum. My name is Susan Hammer, president of City Club, and um, as you know, today is our gubernatorial debate. Uh, before beginning, though, I would like to make a few announcements about uh, City Club and uh, some coming up, ev uh, some events that are coming up soon. Next Friday, on o October 30th, we're going to be uh, holding a forum on ballot measure 48, the one we just discussed on the spending cap. Don McIntyre, who is the author and supporter of measure 48, will be here, along with Steve Novick, who, is an, who opposes the measure. Uh, Paul Warner will, the, will be the moderator. David Callahan will be visiting Portland and will be holding a forum on October 17th on his book, The Moral Center. This is a very interesting book about values, politics, and uh, morals. Uh, Larry Wallach, who is dean of the uh, Portland State University College of Urban and Public Affairs, will be the moderator. This month, in honor of the American Library Association's Banned Book Week, the Citizens Forum will be reading Inherit the Wind, which is a, a fictionalized version, a version of John Scope's Monkey Trial, and will also be showing a film uh, entitled Inherit the Wind. Please check your bulletin for details. These events are open to the public and they are free, but please call City Club to um, re reserve a spot. Finally, this Monday we have Candidates Gone Wild and tickets are available. Our sponsors this quarter at City Club are Baron Liebman LLP and Zimmer Gunsel Frasca, a partnership. Would you please join me in thanking them? Our program today is, are the Oregon gubernatorial debates with Oregon Governor and Democratic candidate Ted Kulingowski and Republican candidate Ron Saxton. Our moderator will be Lee Pelton, president of Willamette University. Facing the risk of saying too little, too much, or the wrong thing about these candidates, we have decided that we will allow them to introduce themselves during their opening remarks. <laughs> It's my pleasure, however, to introduce to you Dr. Lee Pelton. Dr. Pelton has served as president of Willamette University for the past seven years. Under his leadership, Willamette University has flourished. It has been ranked as one of the top 50 liberal arts colleges in the United States by US News and World Report. Uh, it has doubled the number of Willamette students who are receiving the highly competitive national fellowships, the Fulbright, Morris Udall, and National Science Foundation. It's increased diversity enormously. 19% of the, of the student body is now multicultural, making it the most diverse institution of higher education in all of Oregon. Dr. Pelton serves on the boards of PGE, the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, and the Oregon Symphony. So at this point, I'd like to turn the program over to him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Obviously, the uh, requirement that the candidates uh, uh, introduce themselves allows for a longer introduction for me. So <laughs> it is my uh, job to uh, review the format and rules of conduct before we uh, commence today. But I think it's also a uh, marvelous opportunity for all of you to silence your cell phones and uh, otherwise disengage uh, your machinery. Uh, this debate will have several sections. First, each candidate will give a three-minute opening statement. A coin toss determine the order of appearance in this debate, and Ron Saxton will open first. Our timekeeper today is Tamsin Wazell. Following opening statements, the candidates will respond to questions suggested in advance of this meeting by City Club members. A subcommittee of the City Club's program committee composed the final set of questions. And these are the only questions that will be asked today, and there will be no questions taken from the floor. 
We will rely on the judgment of our distinguished panel of City Club members seated here in front of me to decide whether or not the questions have indeed been answered by the candidates. And if two or more of these members raise their cards indicating that they feel a question has not been answered, I will gladly restate the question and ask the candidates to reply again. On our panel, we have Marge Kafori, John Polinuk, and Susan Stone. Following the City Club questions, each candidate will have the opportunity to ask two questions of the other. And following the rotation of candidate questions, each candidate will make a three-minute closing statement. And I ask of you two things. Please be respectful of the candidates, and please hold all applause until the end of the program. And in case you did not hear me, <laughs> and please hold all applause until the end of the program. Gentlemen, please take the podium. Thank you. Please begin with your opening statement. Good afternoon, and thank you, Dr. Pelton, for moderating. And thank you, Governor, for agreeing to appear here today and take questions. It's a pleasure to be here. As I've said over and over, I believe this election is about change. And sometimes change can be daunting. But change is what our state needs. And regardless of what the governor and his staff want you to believe, change can also be energizing and invigorating. Change can lead to reform and better results. And in this case, change can lead to real leadership and real reform. Four years ago, when the governor spoke at his inaugural address, I was, like many Oregonians, optimistic about what could be. Well, I no have no doubt that he and I didn't agree on everything, I want to tell you what he said that day, because I agree with it. Quote, one, government will live within its means. Two. Children are our first priority. Three, we must rebuild our economy and create new job opportunities for Oregon families. And four, the days of business as usual in state government are over. Close quote. Those were and are goals I share, but so little has been done to actually achieve them, and in some cases, exactly the opposite. State government hasn't lived within its means, the governor proposed huge tax increases since taking office, none of which got passed. And even now, Governor Kulongoski has built his campaign around tax increases totaling more than $400 million. Oregon has added jobs, but as one newspaper said, it's hard to determine how big a role the governor played in this. In addition, more than 40% of the jobs added were low paying, according to the Oregon Department of Employment, and Oregon's unemployment rate is still one of the 10 highest in the United States. And it's certainly absurd to say that the days of business as usual are over. And that brings us to putting kids first. Under the governor's watch, kids in Oregon are not better off, and they're not better off because he keeps protecting the status quo and making excuses for poor performance. Don't take my word for it. Take a look at the very report cards the governor and his shills try to discredit. Again, his goal is not to talk about his record or admit we could have done more. It's to make change look scary. As you listen to this debate today, count how many times the governor talks about what he's going to do versus what he has done. Ask yourself whether the grades our state's getting make sense and what might have happened if Governor Kulongowski had led instead of, as Democratic legislator Rick Metzger said, gone into where's Waldo mode. Ask why the governor can't make do with $2 billion of additional revenue, and why so little of that money, less than $500 million, will actually be used to improve state agencies. 
And remember this, while the governor wants to make me look scary and make change sound scary, it's because there's been so little change and so little action in Salem that our state's doing as poorly as it is. In this election, change shouldn't be scary. Change is necessary, and that's why I'm running for governor. Governor Kulingowski, your opening statement, please. I want to thank the uh, City Club of Portland for hosting our third debate of this campaign season. You know, I learned a long time ago that if you want to do a good job representing people, you have to accept responsibility and be willing to be held accountable. Since I've taken office, I've never ducked the hard decisions, and I've always told people exactly what I think. That is the real difference between Ron Saxon and me. My friends and staff sometimes kid me because when I'm asked a question, I always answer it. And even if the answer is politically risky. When you ask Ron a tough question that requires him to take a tough position, his natural instinct is to duck it. That makes him a great politician, but it doesn't not make him a good leader. Given how often he's used the word leadership throughout his campaign, it's something to think about. You can't claim to offer leadership when on Measure 48, which is perhaps the biggest threat facing our public schools. Today, he says, maybe, yes, then maybe no, but I don't want to talk about it anyway. You can't claim to offer leadership when you take, can't take a position on the local school option in Portland when you were the president of the school board and you are a voting resident of this community. You can't claim to offer leadership when you tell some people you're pro-choice and tell the anti-choice lobby you'll sign any restrictions they put in front of you. And you can't claim to offer leadership when you refuse to accept responsibility for the fact that when you ran the Portland School Board, you approved a billion dollars in golden parachutes for administrators. Ron, leadership isn't just a campaign slogan. If you want to hold elective office, it's a responsibility. It's having the courage of your convictions and fighting for your principles. I've always taken that responsibility seriously, and I always will. When I took office, the state had lost nearly 25% of its general fund. It was my responsibility to deal with it, and I did. I cut administrative overhead, reformed PERS, passed the largest transportation infrastructure bill in decades, and most important, I helped rebuild the economy and our revenue base. With a rebounding economy, we have the opportunity to improve our schools and protect them from future cuts. My plan includes dedicating the carpet kicker to a rainy day fund for schools and increasing investments in our public education system. That is my definition of leadership. I look forward to this debate because, as Ron always says, it is about leadership. We will now move to the portion of the program where I will ask the questions prepared in advance by City Club members. The candidate to whom the question is directed will have 60 seconds to respond to the question. Following each answer, the opposing candidate will have the option of a 45-second rebuttal. The candidates have not seen these questions in advance. And we will begin with Governor Kulingowski. Governor, you have said that education should get 61% of the state general fund budget in the next biennium. And right now, education is getting 55.5% of the general fund lottery budget. And if 61% is a good idea tomorrow, wouldn't it have been a good idea yesterday? And why didn't you make sure that 61% of the current budget went to education? The answer to that is the state didn't have the revenue to do it at that time. We had the highest unemployment rate, had the highest hunger rate in the country, had lost nearly $3 billion out of our state general fund. The fact is there were tough choices to be made because there were no other revenue sources that we had and the fact that I did live within our means. We prioritized it in education, K through 12 particularly, did get the biggest piece of that. But the other pieces of our educational system, the community colleges and the higher educate the university systems, we're losing ground. 
And that's why it is so important that now that we have this opportunity, we can take the carpet kicker, put it in a rainy day fund. We can use this improving economy to invest more in the most important decision that we can make in our state government, and that's invest in education at all levels and adopt the education enterprise. Mr. Saxon. In improving economy, it's easy to invest money, and we certainly should invest money, but you're right. The governor didn't do anything in the last four years to help education funding. Spending in this state has gone up. Don't let him tell you the spending went down the last four years. We're spending almost a billion dollars more on K-12 through than we were when he came into office. But no school district's better off because he's done nothing to deal with how effectively the money's spent, nothing to deal with how the schools can work better. Don't let him get away today with talking about the next four years. Make sure you hear the questions and answers about the last four years. Mr. Saxton, you have promised to cut the bureaucracy by 10 percent. What and who do you mean by the bureaucracy? And how much of the state budget is spent on your definition of the bureaucracy? And how much would you save if you cut it by 10 percent. You know, I was shuffling here. There's a report that the governor's people put out here, and I find it, I'll wave it at you. I know we're on radio. But they put out a report, making government work for Oregonians. People he appointed looked at it. In his campaign four years ago, go look, he said there's not a single agency in government that couldn't be 5 percent more efficient. We haven't seen the efficiency, but those are his words. When I talk about what we have to do to address this, the fact is we've got an expensive, big government, big bureaucracy model, and I favor using competition and privatization. You know, one of the governors back east talks about the Yellow Pages test. If you can find a service in the Yellow Pages, government shouldn't be doing it unless government can demonstrate it does it less expensive and more efficiently. When we're talking about printing or data processing or vehicle maintenance or all the things out there, there's a lot that can be done to save money, and he's said it before and his own report said it before. Governor? <laughs> ah, I'm sorry. I am afraid that I will have to repeat this question. Okay. You've promised to cut the bureaucracy by 10%. What and who do you mean by the bureaucracy? And how much of the state budget is spent on your definition of the bureaucracy? And how much would you save if you cut it by 10 percent? The bureaucracy is state government. It is the things, the agencies, the people, the folks doing it. When we talk about the police out front, the school teacher in the classroom, the uh, off the uh, uh, person working with the needy child. Everything that's beyond that, the data processing, the receptionist, the people who clean the office, all of those are things we ought to be doing as inexpensively as possible. Other states have saved hundreds of millions of dollars. You can wave the cards. I don't have the number for you. I'm telling you, he said five, I say 10. Other states have saved at least that much. Governor. The truth is, is I want you to listen to this. When you lose 25 percent of your general fund, you lose three billion dollars. If you're a business and you lose 25 percent of your general fund revenue, you are efficient. That's how you keep going. The agencies did take five, and they took more than five when we lost 25 percent. But I want you to remember this. Mr. Saxon always talks about efficiencies. He hasn't named one of them or what he's going to get from doing it. We have been doing it. The truth is, not only when he talks about the additional revenues in the state, what he doesn't tell you, he wants to give $1.2 billion back through cutting the inheritance tax, cutting the capital gains, and supporting Measure 41. Questioner to, question to Governor Kulingowski. During your first term as governor, you promised to promote an agenda that helped rural Oregons. But now, many rural communities feel more disenfranchised than ever. Why has that happened? And what should you have done to better demonstrate that you are genuinely committed to addressing rural concerns? Well, the very first thing I did was I created the Office of Rural Policy as a cabinet-level position in my office. It actually was reaching out to the rural community, and I get a great deal of acknowledgement from the rural communities for working with them and the staff that I have. 
Secondly, I've traveled this state and tried to spread the economic prosperity that we're having throughout all of Oregon. That's why you read in the paper today that Governor Schwarzenegger and I have called an economic a summit for the Klamath Basin to try to deal with the issues in that area because they are economic issues. It is very difficult, to be very frank with you, to try to spread this economic prosperity throughout all of Oregon because we are different in different parts of the state. So what I did is I went back in this last session and did Connect Oregon, which was a $100 million bonding proposal specifically for rural Oregon, for short line railroads, for seaports and regional airports. We are investing in them. We are trying to bring technology to, through, to them through laying more fiber optic out in the uh, eastern part of the state. It is a difficult, difficult challenge, but I have to tell you, we are making progress. Mr. Saxton. Couldn't disagree more. That was, you know, when I travel around this state to every county over and over, the most common question I get asked is, when you're governor, will you ever come back here? Rural Oregon doesn't think they've ever seen this governor. He never's out there talk, to talk to people out there. And I don't know how this election will come out. I think I'm going to win it. But I guarantee you, rural Oregon will be voting for me because they know he hasn't been there for them at all. Question to Mr. Saxton. Your opponent has talked about a $6 billion budget for schools in the next biennium. But the combination of your support for Measure 41, which would make Oregon income tax revenue dependent on federal formulas, your support for repealing the, state, the estate tax, and your argument that we should put capital gains tax would reduce state revenues by as much as $1.3 billion in the next biennium. If revenues are lower because the measures that you supported are enacted, what would your school's budget be? We're going to have to see how much revenues actually are up. The rep school budget's going to be bigger than it is. I don't have a precise number. We're going to have to see what happens with these measures. But let me be clear, there's a, an assumption there that isn't accurate. I have said I favor phasing out the capital gains tax. I've said I favor phasing out the estate tax. I think both of them have a negative impact on, they have a negative impact on investment, negative impact on revenues, and over a sustained period of time, I think revenues are higher when those are gone. That was the case when Bill Clinton cut the federal capital gains taxes, that capital gains revenues went up after the tax was cut. But if Measure 41 passes, it won't be possible to do it as quickly. And so I've always said, I've said on TV before and other events, we're going to phase in both the estate tax and the capital gains tax. It'll have to be phased in slower, though there are less revenues available. But my goal is to phase them in over time. I think long term they make great economic sense. You know, Ron and I want both to be elected governor, but I'm going to tell you the biggest threat to this state and its education system, as I said in the beginning, is Measure 41 and 48. And what offends me the most, if you want to be the governor of this state, and you see the threat that Measure 48 brings to the state and Measure 41, you should have the courage of your convictions as the candidate to stand up and have the courage to tell the public this is bad public policy for Oregon. It is not good for you. It is not good for your children or your grandchildren. For God's sake, Ron, if you want to be the governor, tell the public this is bad. Don't play this scam with them. Tell them this is bad public policy. Have the courage of your convictions. I will respect you more if you will just say that you're favoring it and you'll fight for it. That is what you should be doing. Question for... Can I have a chance to respond? He's twice said something here about Measure 48. I think I have a right to respond to. Uh, not at this point. Thank you. Question for Governor Kulingowski. Higher education has taken a beating in this state, dropping from 16% of the state budget to 6% ranking as 46th in per student spending nationwide. Any inefficiency that might have been there has pretty much been wrung out of the system. And while more money does not necessarily equate with higher quality, we might agree that Oregon should at least be closer to the middle than to the bottom. And what are your three priorities to get Oregon up to at least the middle on higher education spending? Well, first of all, I want to tell you, when I became the governor, I reconstituted the Board of Higher Education. I replaced it. 
They took on the Chancellor's office, reduced the cost to the Chancellor's office by $6 million, which was able to hold the tuition rate increase down. The fact is, is that I put over $500 million into the capital construction infrastructure side of higher education. I increased the opportunity grants, which is, is as important as the institution is giving students the opportunity to be able to afford to get in the institutions. So we have been moving forward and trying to get the higher education budget up. As part of the education enterprise, we are going to meet the requirements that they ask us for, both on the changing the opportunity grant to the shared responsibility program and the university's budgetary request. We are going to fund them. Mr. Saxton. I'll just respond. Part of it is you need more money, and I want to be clear. The governor opposing Measure 48 plays to his constituency. I have made clear I oppose Measure 48, which is courage, standing up to most of my supporters who support it. It's appeared in every newspaper in Oregon. It's been in editorials in every major newspaper in Oregon, and it's been on every television station in Oregon. The notion that I have been unclear about my position is disingenuous. Next question to Mr. Saxton. At just $10 a year, we have the nation's lowest corporate minimum tax, and that is all that about two-thirds of Oregon corporations pay. And 80% or more of the corporate kicker will go to out-of-state corporations. Meanwhile, the share of total state income tax revenue paid by corporations has dropped from roughly 19% to about 5% over the last 30 years. Given your no new taxes pledge, will you support increasing the corporate minimum tax and waiving the corporate kicker? Or do you believe corporations are already overtaxed? You know, we have one of the weaker economies in America. And what we have to look at here is the fact that I don't favor raising new taxes, but let's talk about why the percent of state revenues from corporations are down. It's not because somebody changed the tax rate. It's because we have far fewer corporations headquartered here. Oregon has lost businesses. It's lost businesses headquartered here. The fact that corporate revenues as a percent is down is a bad thing, not for the reason you're citing, because what it says about our economy. The discussion we need to have is not a discussion about which taxes to raise. The governor goes down this list. Well, let's raise your income taxes. Oh, you didn't like that? How about if we have a sales tax? Oh, you don't like that? How about if I keep your personal kicker? Well, you didn't like that? How about if we raise your cigarette tax? Or how about if we raise the tax on auto insurance? I'm not in search of new taxes. I'm in search of how can we manage the state responsibly with the money we have and make it a better environment for people to invest and put their businesses here. Governor. I am in support. Mr. Saxon, rather than repeating the question, uh, nevertheless, uh, by, uh, I've been directed by the I panel don't know what here part to. Of I don't favor new taxes they find am ambiguous, but that's what I said. Well, you have an opportunity to amplify on what you've just said. At just $10 a year, we have the nation's lowest corporate minimum tax, and that's all that about two thirds of Oregon corporations pay and 80% or more of the corporate kicker will go to out-of-state corporations. Meanwhile, the, state, the share of total state income tax revenue paid by corporations has dropped from roughly 19% to about 5% over the last 30 years. Given your no new, pledges, no new taxes pledge, will you support increasing the corporate minimum tax and waiving the corporate kicker or do you believe corporations are overtaxed? I do not favor new taxes. I believe the corporate kicker could be examined in terms of a trade-off with changing capital gains rates and such, but I am not calling for new taxes. Thank you. Governor. First of all, I want you all to know that in the legislature, the Republican-controlled legislature in the House voted for the change in the corporate minimum in 2003. This isn't new. I do support an increase in the corporate minimum. But let me tell you that what this is about. It's about tax fairness and tax stability. That's why I support putting the corporate kicker into a rainy day fund to give us more fairness and stability. The reason I support the increase in the corporate minimum tax, it's about fairness for the middle income taxpayers in the state to see that businesses and corporations pay their fair share. 
everyone knows, other than Ron, that the $10 corporate minimum is unfair to everyone in this state. Next question to Governor Kulingowski. In 2003, you supported the U.S. invasion of Iraq, and now you oppose that same war. What did you think was going to happen when U.S. troops invaded, and what has changed your mind about the war? You know, first of all, I, I want you to know that this is not about the soldiers. The soldiers are doing their duty with honor. They're to be respected for it. What has failed is their civilian leadership and the conduct of the war. The fact is, if you go back and look, when I went to Iraq in 2004 and I came back, I said the very first thing is we have to have a timetable to get out of there because these people are a very proud people and they will not long tolerate an occupying army in that country. I said it again in my State of the State address and I got criticized resoundingly because of the fact I raised it in the State of the State. I have been consistent on this part that the United States had to have an exit strategy. It is obviously the administration will not put one together. What we have to do as a people to understand that we have to give the Iraqi government, a democratically elected government, timetables, standards, accountability standards. Tell me how much electricity you're turning on, how much garbage you're picking up, how many jobs you're creating. Don't let us be a crutch Governor, for these people over there. Thank you. Mr. Saxton. Well, I agreed with the governor when he called for a removing Saddam Hussein, and I certainly support our troops, and I admire the governor for going to the funerals. It's a wonderful thing he does. I'd like to see our troops home as well, and I would not pretend I have any special information on foreign policy issues. I support our troops, hope to see them home as soon as we can get them here. Next question to Mr. Saxton. In your paid advertisements, you've accused your opponent of raising fees by $1,000 for every Oregonian. Your campaign has admitted that it can't prove this is true and you should know that a governor doesn't have the power to raise fees without legislative action. That ad in combination with your education funding television ad recently criticized by the Oregonian appeared to be part of a deliberate strategy to distort your opponent's record. And why should voters think that you would be the kind of governor they could trust to tell them the truth? Well, I uh, stand by all of those ads. I don't agree. There's very partisan writers who've criticized them, absolutely, no question. I have to remember, you know, somewhere close to half the voters of Oregon are going to support for the, the governor. The ads we've run are factual. I stand behind them. Fees and costs in Oregon have gone up by that amount of money or some amount very close to that. The information in the other ads I stand behind. Uh, in a minute, I can't go through each of our ads, but in short, I stand behind the ads. Governor. Well, first of all, the, the fee issue has been going on since 1991, and what is unfair is just to actually bring the accumulation of it and putting it on my shoulders and say every one of them was because of you. This is the result of Measure 5, when in fact Measure 5 passed that the legislature has been looking for other ways to actually generate revenue, and they've been doing it through the fee process. That is why this whole issue of what I told you earlier about tax fairness and tax stability is so critically important to this state. It is an issue, and we have to address it, but the fee issue, Ron knows, is not correct, but it's good politics, and that's the way it is. Next question to Governor Kulingowski. You have a reputation with many observers of being disengaged from aggressively and personally doing what is necessary to achieve your objectives. Even some of your supporters believe the four years under your watch have been lackluster. What's the basis for these opinions? And how are you going to convince the voters that the next four years won't just be more of the same? Well, let me start with this way. 
Under my term, I covered 30,000 more kids under the Oregon Health Plan. I reduced hunger in the state from 1 to 7, 19th in the country. I enacted the nation's toughest meth laws. I shut down 70% of the homegrown meth labs in this state. I cracked down on predatory lenders, calling a special session to enact payday loan legislation. I led a less special session to add an additional $42 million to our public schools. I added 50,000 students to the Opportunity Grant pro Program. I established 50 shovel-ready sites throughout the state. I recruited companies like Google, Amy's Kitchen, Genentech, Lowe's, Cardinal Glass to the state. I helped create over 120,000 new jobs. I recruited and brought to this state many, many new businesses. I brought about stricter emission control standards for cleaner air in Oregon. I broke a decade-long decade, long decade uh, a stagnant uh, attempt to get more transportation money for the state, a $2.5 billion package. I created a small, come on, I can keep Governor, going. The stopwatch is going. You. <laughs> Governor, your time has expired. Ms. Your time has expired, but I must uh, ask you to uh, respond to this question again. I'll repeat it. You have a reputation with many observers of being disengaged from aggressively and personally doing what is necessary to achieve your objectives. Even some of your supporters believe the four years under your watch have been lackluster. What's the basis for these opinions? And how are you going to convince the voters that the next four years won't just be more of the same? Let me tell you that the fact is, is but I can go down this list and I could stand up here another 20 minutes with you and tell you everything we did. So what is the basis for it? There's none. The fact is, is we have moved forward very, very aggressively. Now let me suggest something to you. That one of the things that any time that you have lost 25% of your general, general fund revenues, there's hard decisions to be made and everybody doesn't get what they want. We have had a very, very aggressive agenda for the state, and we have been very successful with it. We've invested in people, not just the process, but in people. Mr. Saxton. Well, the basis for it is true. He has one of the three lowest approval ratings of any governors in America, and the other two governors are already exiting office. Why is this one of the two closest races in America? Why is this the closest race with an incumbent who can't get reelected? Because people know what your question asked is true. They know his leadership's been disappointing and that he hasn't been there. They know he hasn't got the job done. That's what this election's about. Be real clear. We can have as many questions as you want today. This election's about, are you proud of the leadership he's delivered? Are you excited? Has he made Oregon all it can be? Are we living up to our potential as a state? The people who wrote that question know we're not living up to our potential, and I know we're not living up to our potential, and you all know it. And that's why we're going to have a new governor in a month. Final question to Mr. Saxton. You have claimed to be able to cut inefficiencies in government by privatizing certain functions. What three state functions would you privatize? How much would each save state government? And why should voters believe in privatization given the federal government's experiences with Halliburton and other private contractors? You know, the fact that somebody does something wrong doesn't mean that you shouldn't try doing it right. Let's be clear. When I chaired the Portland School District Board, we looked at how do you privatize the warehouse. We were spending a lot of money for a warehouse, so we put it out to competitive bid. Turned out private operators could operate it for $3 million less. Some people said, well, we don't want to eliminate the jobs in the warehouse and change it. And so the question that came to the board was, do you want to spend the extra $3 million in the warehouse, or would you rather use it to hire teachers? Pretty easy decision. We decided to hire teachers. Warehouse still operated. All of those kind of functions, the data processing, the payroll functions, the warehousing, the vehicle maintenance, it's a long list of them. I want to go through the process of testing. Are they being done the most efficient way they can be done? You know, we get argument back and forth between the governor's people, but when the sheriffs endorsed me in this campaign, they cited the prison food example. Clackamas County, Washington County, Deschutes County, they use private vendors for their food. They save a lot of money. I'm happy to go on, but time's up. Mr. Saxon. Thank you both. Uh, do I get oh, you? Uh, Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Lance. Yes. Let me just tell you about, I'm going to tell you about efficiencies because not only was it the fact that we lost the revenue that we had to do a number of things for efficiencies, but let me just tell you, 
We created a smart buying program in the, in the purchasing pool for the state of Oregon and stayed this state over $25 million. I actually, uh, um, of all things to save money, I reformed PERS. Great move for the state. The fact is, is that this whole idea about prison food and everything else, we are the 12th on a comparative listing of 50 states. We have the 12th most efficient food system for our correctional institution of any state in the country. Under my watch, because we made some changes in it, we're privatizing printing in the state to let more companies have access to it. We are moving to make government more efficient, and we are looking to see if there are things that the private sector can do better than we do. Thank you. Thank you both. During the, this portion of the program, each candidate will ask three questions of the other. I thought it was two. It's two questions. We both think Sorry. it's two. You're both right. We only have two. We only have two. That's the problem. Questions must be asked in 30 seconds. The opposing candidate will have one minute to respond, after which, after which the questioner will have the option of a 30-second rebuttal. And we will alternate between the candidates, and we will begin with Mr. Saxton. You've essentially staked your legacy on being able to fund the following programs with $400 million of new taxes. Your Healthy Kids Initiative, adding 125 new troopers to the state police, expanding Head Start, increasing student aid for higher education, and creating a rainy day fund. You've proposed these taxes because your education enterprise consumes almost all the extra revenue, almost $2 billion state government will have to spend in the next biennium. My question is this, given that Oregonians are in no mood to raise taxes, and in fact voted down tax increases you previously proposed, what is your plan B? There is no plan B because the legislature and I believe the public supports the proposal that I have, first of all, for putting the corporate kicker into a rainy day fund to protect education when the economy turns again. Two, for increasing the cigarette tax to go to parity with Washington to be able to fund the Healthy Kids Initiative to see that 117,000 children in the state have access to health care. For increasing the corporate minimum to making preschool. All eligible three and four year olds under Head Start are going to be funded under this program. These are things that the legislature, some of them have already done in the past. They are there. All they need is this session. They want to invest in the education enterprise. We have the resources. This is the time for Oregon after its three bad years of trying to get when 01, 03, when the revenues in the state were dropping, this is the time to reinvest in Oregon, to reinvest in the citizens, and we can do that. Mr. Saxton. I just have to say, in the, your first term, you proposed tax increases repeatedly and got zero of them into law. So a second term that's premised on all of these coming into law, if that's your only plan, I believe you have no plan at all. Governor Kulingowski, your first question of Mr. Saxton. Ron, uh, you ran an attack ad blaming me for illegal immigrants in the state. The Oregonian now reports that you, you knew long before you ran the ad that some of your migrant workers on your cherry farm might have been there illegally. Illegal immigration wasn't a big issue in the 1990s, you said. Quote, you knew it wasn't anything we talked about 10 years ago. That was, there was no discussion about it at that time. Let me ask you this question. Do you only care about following the law about immigration is when people are paying attention? Well, that's a very, very selective quotation from what the article said. The article said that they had people investigate and look and they could find no evidence that we had hired anyone illegally. I'm proud of my record there and we can talk about that all you'd like, but let's be real clear here. Illegal immigration is something where this governor has had three positions in the last three weeks that I've heard. When we talk about driver's licenses during the first three years of his administration, the state makes essentially no effort to determine whether people are citizens or here legally. Then when he and I are at Chemeketa Community College, he talks about how he's leading the country and one of the toughest people in enforcing these standards for driver's licenses and how we have to shut the borders. And then when we go to Willamette Week, he's got another position, which is that, well, he thinks we ought to be checking val uh, and validating citizenship before we hand these out, but it's really expensive and it's going to be hard to do. You want to talk about who's been consistent on immigration, I stand by my record. 
You know, one of the things that uh, is interesting about this is this is another issue because I asked the question, which he merely responded to in the newspaper, and it's everything uh, that you've listened to. And I, I go back to my opening comment to you about leadership. Everything is somebody else's problem with Mr. Saxton. Somebody else is the, re uh, the responsible for it. He is an innocent third party on his cherry farm when he was the chairman of the school board. It wasn't his fault of the golden parachutes. It was Ben Canada, as you remember, is in the paper. You know, it is a great disservice to the people in this state and to the farmers of the state to run these ads. And Ron should have been ashamed for him running them in the first place. Mr. Saxon, your next question of Mr. Kulingowski. Can you please justify to Oregonians why, under your administration, years which saw $2 billion in general and lottery fund growth, you couldn't find $20 million to start the restoration of the state police and enhance the crime lab? Well, the truth of it is, Ron, we did add 40 new state troopers. We did increase the forensic labs. The dilemma for the state police is the fact that they not only need more troopers on the road to help us with the meth interdiction, the dilemma for us is that they need a dedicated funding source, a source that they can come in every legislative session and know that the troop doesn't have to worry that there's going to be cuts in their particular uh, uh, employment. What the dilemma for us is, is trying to find that dedicated funding source. Everyone here remembers they used to be in the highway fund. They came out in about 1980. I tried to get them back in in 2003, and the legislature said no. I tried again in 2005 with the dedication of the proceeds from the line games to trying to give the state police a dedicated funding source. That is why I've looked at another option around a surcharge on liability insurance prog programs. If you don't like that, I think that we should come up and find a dedicated funding source for the police to see that they have the resources to get the troopers they need. Well, no one I know in the law enforcement community thinks much progress was made. You again heard one of those answers about what he will do in the future, and it involved doing it if he can raise your taxes. That's exactly the problem. We haven't seen the leadership to actually confront the problems in the first years, to use the growth that was there in the first years. Everything's a promise about the future, and everything involves needing new taxes. Governor Kulingowski, your next question of Mr. Saxton. Ron, under President Bush, the federal government has moved away from its traditional partnership with the states by cutting funding for education and health care, mandating federal programs such as the federal No Child Left Behind and the Real ID Act with no funds to implement these programs, prohibiting senior citizens from obtaining cheaper prescription drugs in Canada, and supporting policies that degrade our environment and our quality of life. My question to you is yes or no. Has President George Bush been good for this state and this country? I don't at all support a lot of the things you just said George Bush has done. The truth is, I told Gordon Smith before it was acted, I thought No Child Left Behind wasn't going to be a very good idea, and I think there are a lot of problems with it. You know, I've spent a lot of time in my life working in Alaska. If you call the Alaska governor and say, what's one of your two or three principal jobs of being governor of Alaska? He'll tell you it's being an effective advocate at the federal level for the people of Alaska. Well. I'm not here to defend the administration's policies. There are a lot of them. We can go on a, down a long list of things that the Bush administration's done I don't agree with. I'm going to be the kind of governor that's an effective advocate for Oregonians. I'm going to be there for Oregonians, and we will be challenging the federal administration, whether they're Republican or Democrat, during my years in office. Governor. You know, one of the things that I'm always amazed at is, in fact, what Ron has said before is he can't find anything that he would criticize President Bush about, about his policies or the war. He has been a step-in-step -step person with the Bush administration. Think about this. The president is the one that says he can cut taxes for the wealthy and still look out for the middle-income taxpayers. We can fight a war. We can do all of these things by cutting the inheritance tax, capital gains, it's almost like Bush too, if you listen to him very closely. Thank you. We will now move to the final portion of the program where each uh, candidate will give a three-minute closing statement. And we will begin with 
Mr. Saxton. In one week, Oregonians will receive their ballots in the mail, and before them will be a simple question. Does Ted Kulongoski deserve to be reelected, or is it time for change in Oregon? Obviously, I believe the answer is change. I believe that Oregon can do better and that real leadership and real changes are badly needed. Change is needed so we can reform our education system and boost student achievement. Change is needed so we can reduce the cost of health care and find ways to ensure 600,000 Oregonians without health insurance. Change is needed so our highways are patrolled 24 hours a day, seven days a week, by a full force of state troopers instead of a force that's been decimated by cuts. More than almost anything, change is needed so we can stop drifting towards mediocrity. Under Governor Kulongoski's leadership, all too often we're playing for worst instead of first, and far too frequently what's merely average is being passed off as acceptable. Not in my Oregon, not in a Saxton administration. I expect more from our state, and I expect more from our state government. Oregon can do better, and we all know it. And I want to be clear, when I speak of not living up to our potential, I speak of state government under Ted Kulongoski. When I speak of waste and mismanagement and lacking ambition, I speak of state government under Ted Kulongoski. When I speak of an enterprise in need of imagination and innovation and energy, I speak of state government under Ted Kulongoski. And I draw this distinction because all over Oregon, Oregonians are succeeding, not because of our current governor, but despite Ted Kulongoski and his administration that is uninspired, uninterested, and unengaged. Think for a moment what we could have achieved in the last four years if it had been filled with action and new ideas. Think what could have happened if we had had a governor who was engaged with Oregonians. To that end, I want to today invite Oregonians to join me in a conversation for change. Starting tomorrow, through the internet and email, my campaign will launch a new initiative designed to engage Oregonians in the political process. By visiting conversationsforchange.com, Oregonians will have an opportunity to suggest what they want our state to look like, an opportunity to present ideas, complaints, and insights. The purpose is simple. Working together by sharing ideas, we can improve education, ensure our kids have not just good schools but great schools. We can restore trust in how state government's managed. We can reduce the cost of health care for all Oregonians. And we can foster a climate that's friendly to business, allowing our economy to grow and prosper with good paying jobs. Government doesn't have all the answers, and that's why important to me we have these conversations for change with you, the voters. Only when we work together, as one Oregon, will we lead our state to a better place. Thank you for hosting this, and I ask for your vote. Thank you. Governor Kulingowski, your closing statement, please. You know, I started this off with the statement about leadership and accountability and responsibility. And we've heard a lot from Ron about the word leadership, but you haven't seen it much here today by him or on the campaign. Ron, you've shirked ownership and responsibility in a number of issues in this campaign. In defending the golden parachutes that you gave to the former superintendent of Portland schools and his administrators, you blame Ben Canada. In defending the television ads about immigration and schools which were labeled misleading in the Oregonian ad watch, you said that the nuances of the ads are not important. In response to questions about whether you had actually hired undocumented workers in your cherry orchard, you said, I don't know, it wasn't something that we talked about 10 years ago. In response to the questions about the Oregon school, local option up here in Portland, the city where you live, and you were the chairman of the school board, you said that you don't get involved in local issues and you weren't going to give anybody any information about it. And I don't think anyone in this room is quite sure what you think about Measure 48, the Tabor Amendment, although we will know, we won't know, that uh, you're going to go out and talk about it to anyone. But I will make you this promise today. If you will join with me, we will cut an ad together and both cut an ad and go on television and tell the public that Tabor, Measure 48, is bad public policy and the voters of this state should vote against it. If you want to be a leader, step up to the challenge. Now let me talk to you about a couple of other things, about global warming. That, you know what was said, you said? That's not the job of the governor. He says even though we can reduce the emissions at the state level, which I've done, the fact is he didn't think he wanted to talk about it. Iraq. He says, that's a federal issue. 
He said that, in fact, he can't find anything that he would criticize the president about, about the war in Iraq. He says that even though this state has lost over 75 soldiers into the complex in Iraq and Afghanistan. Increased health care co coverage for kids, that's up to the private sector, Ron says. Ron, real, real leadership isn't about campaign slogans. It's about producing results, results that make people's lives better. When I became governor, we had the highest unemployment and hunger rates in the country, and as I said, we had nearly a $3 billion shortfall. But because I made tough decisions, today most Oregonians have jobs, and many Oregonians have m more jobs today than ever before, and our hunger rate has come down. We have done many good things, and we're going to do things in the future. But let me suggest something in closing to you. Winning and running a campaign isn't just about whacking at the other person. It's about your vision of where you want to go in the future. You have not heard one thing from Ron Saxon about his vision of Oregon in the future or any ideas about where he wants us to go. I urge you to vote for me for re-election because Oregon is better off today than it was thank four you, years Governor. ago. Thank you. thank you, Governor, and thank you, Mr. Saxton, and good luck to both of you. Thank you. thank you. I would like to thank our candidates, Governor Kulingowski and Ron Saxon, for their participation today, our moderator, Lee Pelton, and our timekeeper, Tamsin Wazell. We are adjourned. <laughs>